to endurance icons, where we sit down with individuals who are excelling and inspiring in the world of endurance sports. We're your hosts, Mark and Jessica Cullen. And today we have one of the most requested podcast guests on the show, professional OCR racer, Ryan Atkins. He is one of those incredibly well-rounded athletes who crushes it in not just OCR, but ultra running, cycling, adventure racing, and a lot of other sports that we're going to get into today. He also is a multiple times Spartan and toughest mutter world champion. Welcome, Ryan. So happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is awesome. Nice to meet you guys. Ryan, I see you're coming to us from a, a car right now. So maybe you could tell us uh, first where you were just based out of before and kind of uh, where you're heading to right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we left our home in Sutton, Quebec today, and we're heading out to uh, Crow's Nest Pass, um, where we're going to spend the next couple months in the Canadian Rockies, just uh, adventuring and skiing and climbing and um, and doing all the all the great things I've always, um, yeah, I was always wanted to spend more time than, you know, just a week or two here and there. And so this is, uh, I guess, before we have kids and stuff and, you know, become more uh, tied down, figured we'd take this opportunity to uh, make it happen and then like fully immerse ourselves in the big mountains. Nice. And what are your plans while you're out there? What are uh, some things you're kind of focusing on in terms of training, like certain skiing or cycling or running? <laughs> what does that kind of look like? it's gonna be just mostly skiing and climbing and kind of like yeah alpinism climbing mountains um ice climbing uh all those kinds of things and yeah lots of skiing very cool yeah and i saw your like your instagram has some amazing stuff about uh all the time you spent in the mountains why did you move to uh sutton quebec before there's some it looks like an amazing spot but uh why had you chosen that as your base camp yeah, so we used to live actually in um, kind of in Bell Fountain in Caledon, Ontario, uh, not too far from yeah Collingwood area. And uh, I guess we just wanted more vert, more mountains to play with and things like that. And we kind of still want to be driving distance from our families and our friends in uh, Ontario. And so we kind of looked like, where's the nearest big mountain <laughs> and we kind of settled on um on Sutton Quebec and uh yeah it's been great there it's a great place to train um the mountain there kind of behind us is uh, almost a thousand meters tall at the summit and so lots of uh vert and terrain to play with great trails wonderful mountain biking um really good snow uh the winters just kind of seem to be just a little bit better than they were in uh, Ontario so it's less of that ice snow kind of back and forth that we were getting a lot in Caledon and just more just you know snow that you can kind of depend on so um yeah that's what we did cool yeah I'm always jealous when I see those uh Instagram photos of you and the dogs frolicking in the mountains we're here <laughs> we're here in Ontario not far from we're just in Waterloo so not too far from Bell Fountain there and yeah it definitely looks a little more fun out there do you have the dogs with you Ryan are you traveling with yeah them? yeah we're traveling with the dogs in the, in the truck here so uh got a full full truck it's full of the brim <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, I also understand you're just coming off a, a race a couple weeks ago. It looked like you raced a Bandera 100 kind of, uh, why did you throw that race in the calendar and how did that one go for you? Yeah. So I, um, I mean, last year I really kind of focused on a lot of cycling events, um, as well as OCR in the latter part of the season. And then this year I kind of wanted to, I don't know, I guess throw my hat back in the ring of like ultra running and things like that. And it just seemed like Bandera was a good time of the year for me. Um, just from doing a lot of running in the fall and like early winter to kind of like just take that fitness and just, just do an ultra and just to see, you know, um, what my strengths are, what my weaknesses are. If I still like ultra running, um, if it's something I actually want to do more of or not and things like that. So, uh, that was down in Texas. Uh, I finished fifth in that race and, um, yeah, it was a good race. It was like, not the most, I guess, inspiring course ever. Uh, but it was still pretty cool. It was like, you know, rolling Hills and some rocky terrain and, um, yeah, and it was a great scene. It was a really competitive race. It's one of the, uh, golden States, um, 
qualifying events. So there's, there's tons of people there, tons of fast guys, girls. Yeah, that's cool. Nice casual 100k to start the year. <laughs> yeah, I get, <laughs> yeah. I think I think everyone's getting a feel for uh, where we're going with this. That you've done some pretty epic stuff and uh, some more epic stuff to come. Um, I'd love to turn back the clock a little bit and and see kind of how you ended up kind of in this uh, pro OCR kind of um, lifestyle here, and uh, we'll kind of jump to to where you're going forward. But maybe we can turn back the clock and talk about because I've seen uh, talks about a unicycle, some hockey, soccer, um, cross country mountain bike, and maybe take us through kind of the path of where all those fit in on your way to becoming kind of a, a pro. OCR yeah, racer. totally. So, uh, I grew up, I was doing, um, I guess just typical like Canadian, you know, young person things, um, playing hockey and soccer and football and things like that and then uh, I actually went to mountain bike camp I grew up in Ottawa so I went to mountain bike camp in Gatineau Parks um, park when I was uh, I guess like 10 or 11 and kind of discovered mountain biking and really enjoyed that and then um, but never I didn't do it competitively at all I just kind of me and my friends it was funny because we were more like free riding and like jumping off things and then that kind of segued into uh, unicycling and trials, unicycling, mountain unicycling. Um, and so that's just like, yeah, we would ride down, you know, the World Cup mountain bike downhill courses on our unicycles and we would, you know, jump off handrails on our unicycles and just basically whatever you can kind of dream up, um, we would try to do. And so that was really cool. Uh, and then all the while, I guess I was, in your uh, high school at the time and I would have been like playing uh sorry football and rugby and wrestling as well um so yeah some team sports some individual sports and then uh when I started university I kind of got back into mountain biking and started racing uh cross-country mountain bikes and so that kind of became <laughs> pretty uh consuming um for a while and I raced uh as high as like on the world cup circuit in cross country mountain bike uh events and yeah Canada Cups and all that good stuff um had a lot of fun and I guess that was kind of my first foray into more endurance based um sports and then as I was kind of like coming to the realization that uh I was like well I don't know if I will be able to make this into like a full-time career or not. It was kind of like before the whole age of uh, social media. And I think now I could probably do it a lot easier, but it was like kind of like either you're like the best or the second best in Canada, or you like basically weren't able to turn it into a career. Um, so I went back and I started working as an engineer again. And I then, discovered that I really didn't like that that much sitting in an office all day um, and subsequently found running and found ultra running and obstacle racing and my first obstacle race was the badass dash um, which I think isn't too far from you guys yeah. and uh, I, I won that event and I won an ATV at it um, which was like more than I'd ever won in like any mountain bike race. And I was like, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. Um, so that kind of like was the slow trickle introduction into obstacle racing. And from there, like I did Spartan racing, I did World Toughest Mudder and um, won that and did Spartan World Championships. And then it was kind of like, it got to the point where it was just kind of consuming, you know, all my time to travel to these events because they were all over North America. So you know, I would have to like take a Friday off of work and a Monday and um, things like that. And it just became like we were racing 20, 30 times uh, a year. And it just was like, OK, well, I'm just going to do this full time now. So, um, yeah, that was you know, I don't know how many years ago that was probably seven or eight years ago. And that's been um, the trajectory so far. So it's been pretty, pretty awesome, pretty lucky to have been able to live that um, lifestyle. So what were you doing for work before you went uh, full-time with OCR? Yeah, I was working as a mechanical engineer um, in the aggregate industry, designing like heavy 
machinery and crushers, stackers, uh, you know, giant, giant machines that weigh 30, 40, 50 tons, uh, things like that. So, yeah. Well, cool. does, does any cool. of that expertise still come into anything you're doing these days? Oh, absolutely. I think having just um, gone to school for engineering, it helps so much, you know, in, uh, in sport because you can kind of like sit back and analyze things and analyze the course, you know, gear, um, just every little last percentage of performance or how to attack a problem, I think has been really helpful throughout my athletic career. Nice. Um, when you talk about some of these uh, OCR races, you've done some pretty epic ones like uh, World's Toughest Mudder there, which is like crazy 24 hour long one. Um, is there like a, a certain race that really jumps out at you as like the toughest one you've ever done that you really had to dig deep for? Uh, whenever you're doing an obstacle race for 24 hours, it's usually not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there was one in there was one in uh, the Spartan ultra world championships in um sweden was very hard it was up and down it was in Uda, sweden which is a big ski hill and it was in i think december um so we were running up and down this crazy steep mountain um uh, with obstacles for 24 hours and it was snowing uh it's quite cold um and yeah, it was just like looking back at it, it was a pretty wild race. <laughs> so that oh, was man. that probably takes the cake. But honestly, like the first time I did World Service Mother was probably like for me the hardest because I was I knew I didn't know what I was doing and I was the least prepared. So it was just like one of those uh I guess events of just wanting it more. Um and just like wanting to like really put yourself into like such a awful place uh for such a long period of time and like looking back at it i'm like man i was like <laughs> young and kind of dumb but yeah <laughs> what what was the location for that world's toughest mother that one was in uh in new jersey and i think it's it was like november late november uh in new jersey so i mean like in the water obstacles there'd be like a little bit of ice on them um so like pretty cold at night uh, just miserable and those courses were there's just there's so much mud and water and uh it's just a slog so you're just cold and wet for 24 hours straight yeah exactly oh <laughs> you wear you end up wearing like a wetsuit uh once it like after a few hours of racing because like it starts getting dark out and then it gets really cold and so you're in a wetsuit so you can't really run that well either because you're like in this wetsuit um but it the wetsuit helps obviously <laughs> keep you from totally freezing yeah and what what would you be eating on a like 24 hour event like that like are you going pure like liquid and like gels and stuff like that or tons of solid food in there what did that look like yeah it's funny now i would do like a lot more liquid calories um something like uh yeah like a sports nutrition um product that has you know kind of everything you need but like lots of calories probably like three to four hundred calories per bottle i would probably do that with like a little bit of real food if i were like doing it nowadays but back then again i didn't really know what i was doing so i was just i was eating lots of like canned fruit and pbj sandwiches and pizza and just kind of like whatever you could um which like isn't it's not like it's not like bad bad and i would still like you know rely on that once you get some palate fatigue but um yeah i was kind of very green at the time and just like smashing as much food as possible yeah but imagine there's no shortage of calories especially on a cold race like that man your body's burning so much extra on a day like that too that must have been crazy. yeah <laughs> totally and like back then so now you're allowed a pit crew but back then you were when they first started the race you were only allowed pit for the first five hours of the race and then they had to leave and then you were just kind of on your own um so you had like a little you could set up a tent and you could have like kind of your food sitting out but you would just kind of roll through and uh eat whatever you could find and then just keep going so that was pretty yeah it was a hard race 
<laughs> and 19 yeah. hours of it solo after they leave oh man you're like delirious and frozen cold november <laughs> home what yeah an and, it, and it's not even like you can look forward to like you know you couldn't really look that forward into coming into the pit because you have to like do everything yourself which is a huge a huge pain um and just like energy drain when you because normally when you can pit it's like your pit crew takes care of you and like that's something that's like so nice to like you know take your socks off and make sure you're like feet aren't totally wrecked or do, do all those little things but like when you're on your own it, it does make a big difference wow yeah that's epic yeah without a pit crew there man i'm sure you could make some pretty silly mistakes and cost yourself a lot of time and something <laughs> like that holy yeah um, I'd love to hop into a couple other uh, events that we've kind of seen have been prominent. Uh, first one I'd love to hop into would be uh, we had Bob Miller on one of our earlier podcasts and he talked about that eco challenge event you guys were part of. Uh, tell us a little bit about that experience for you. Yeah, uh, eco challenge was it was amazing. Um, yeah, world's toughest race, eco challenge, whatever you call it. Uh, this was an adventure race we did in 2019. Um, in Fiji and it was uh, an expedition length race put on by Amazon hosted by Bear Grylls it was uh it's one of those experiences that like you'll never or I don't think I'll ever forget um it was just there were so many parts of it that were just you know brand new to me um new experiences and just like so colorful and vivid uh just being out there with your teammates relying on each other going through this crazy trying uh experience together uh yeah it was it was unreal it took our team seven days to finish um and i think there was four four uh checkpoints but like um kind of like controls where you'd like come in and you'd have a, a transit a ta like a almost like a crew member who would um stop and they would you know do those things for you like take care of your feet and uh, you'd smash a bunch of food and, uh, and then you get back on your way. So, um, definitely a lot of sleep deprivation. We did not sleep a whole lot. And, uh, but like going through something that with, the, going through something like that with a team is just, it's like a really powerful experience because you really end up, everybody ends up going through so many highs and lows. And it's just all about, I guess, managing each other and like being there for each other. And we had such a awesome team, like, yeah, Bob was our um, our team captain, and he was in charge of the navigation, and uh, kind of kept us all all going. And yeah, we had a blast. Nobody ever really got too down on each other or upset, even though like we made some, you know, pretty big mistakes out there on uh, navigation and um, just all sorts of stuff. <laughs> like I guess when you're doing something for seven days there's a lot that can go wrong and inevitably does um but yeah I think we worked really well as a team and yeah it was great yeah Bob had mentioned that you had uh he first he talked about the night um before the end of the race where you had extreme sleep deprivation and he told us a little bit about the sports psychologist that you worked with but what I really want to know is we asked him um because you did quite well in that race and we asked mm -hmm. if he had any inkling or inclination of how well uh, the team would do. And he said he didn't think uh, that far ahead, but he said that he felt like you knew right from the get-go that you were going to be like one of the, the the podium steps. So I have to ask, <laughs> when you went into that, <laughs> did you go in there to win it uh, with that mindset? Uh, I went into it with the mindset of, I think something really cool could happen if we work well together and also with the mindset of like we are physically and skill wise just as capable as all these other teams and so like why not why couldn't we do well you know kind of like um to not like I mean if we had finished 30th I wouldn't have been like that disappointed or anything and that's just what it would have been but um I guess just going in with like the knowledge and confidence that something special could happen. No, oh, I love that. Um, and I feel like I should like be personally thanking you because you gave me one of my favorite sporting events that uh, Mark and I watched over COVID. Um, and that was the, uh, the Spartan games that you did, uh, oh, over cool. COVID. 
Um, yeah. If for anyone listening who hasn't watched it, please go back and watch that. It was it was absolutely incredible, and it was totally the boost that I needed. Like it was at a time where you couldn't race. It was such great competitive fire. I'd love to hear a little bit about what that experience was like being a part of those games during COVID. Yeah, I mean, it was oh, it was so great just to have something to do, something to uh, an event to compete in, um, because basically for that whole year, I would kind of train for an event and get really excited and be like, all right, the next race definitely happening. This is what's going to go on. And I would like train super hard. And then, you know, like two or three weeks out, it'd get canceled. And then they'd be like, oh, but like the next race should happen. And so to spend a whole year with that happening, um, it was just hard, I guess, emotionally to go through that time and time again. And so when we were finally had Spartan games. They had these, you know, contingencies set up to make it so that we could actually compete. It was just like, yeah, it was like, awesome. Let's go, let's do this. And so we had like a, a little bit of an idea of the sort of events that would be going on. And so we trained to our best abilities. Um, like we kind of thought that there would be a swim because they said that we needed a wetsuit and like things like that. And like, we thought there'd be a mountain bike because they said they'd be needed a mountain bike. So like we, yeah, we did what we did to train, but it was also just like, there was a massive element of the unknown. And so it was kind of like just an uh, experience of, I guess, letting go of like the things that are outside of your control and just like stepping up and every day just competing, you know, as hard as you can. And to the best of your abilities and just seeing what would happen and so that was uh yeah it was it was a really fun event um i had a blast <laughs> yeah and then you won which is fun yeah. as well <laughs> yeah um, yeah Win winning's always good too it is <laughs> um one of the things that fascinates me about you is the diversity <clears throat> of the sports that you do so often when you're going to compete at something at a very high level you focus in on one sport um, and you bring this almost level of playfulness to your sport. Uh, you have, you do OCR training and you do trail running and you cycling and cross country skiing. And I've been seeing on your Instagram, ice climbing. I'd love to know a little bit about, uh, why you view this as a recipe for success. If you do, um, and just talk a little bit about why you've taken this approach to your sport. Yeah, totally. Um, well, first of all, I think that life would be a little my life would be a lot more boring if I just did the same exact thing all the time um second of all like the thing that's great about OCR is that you can train for it in a lot of different ways mm -hmm. like you can like I can go ice climbing and I can say well I train you know the benefit of that was grip strength training today mm -hmm. instead of just um if I was like strictly a runner or strictly a cyclist I would go ice climbing and be like well that was a big waste of time um so it's a pretty cool sport in that respect where like you can justify doing different activities different sports and different styles styles slash modes of training in order to prepare yourself for the events and then like I guess also just I love learning new things and I love like developing skills and that's what that's like one of the things that really excites me. So I think if I were to just kind of stay in my own lane and never have those experiences, um, yeah, I just would be less excited. And there is definitely an element where it's like, would I be like this year, for instance, I did a lot of, of, of cycling training and I did a bunch of racing. I did um, Canadian like nationals, which I raced in um, master uh, expert. And I did uh, a couple gravel races and I did all sorts of awesome stuff. I did uh, a stage race down in Vermont on road bikes. And I was just like super amped on biking. And as a result, my running suffered. And I thought that like, I was like, oh, if I, if I do a little bit of running while I do all this biking and then I transition back to running, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'll be like back up to full speed. And that was like a really interesting experiment because it actually took me more like two months to get all my running like speed and power back not just a couple weeks which is like what I thought but it's like it's an amazing learning lesson and um and I had a blast biking and then I still went to Barton Road Champs and finished second at the end of the season and um and like yeah would my OCR season have been like I probably would have 
had some more results that were a bit better in the middle of the season, but I was like, what I really wanted to do. I've, you know, I've already been there and done that. I've like won all those races before and I wanted to like test myself and see if I could still like compete with these top cyclists um, across a bunch of disciplines. And if I could like, if I could do that. And so that's what was exciting me. And so like, I didn't end up getting burnt out as a result and I was excited to train and I was excited for race and I was injury free and things like that. So it's like, I guess I'm just able to justify the like multifaceted uh, approach that I take. And I really love it <laughs> so much that uh, um, I guess I think the trade-offs are, are worth it. Yeah. To me. No, that makes sense. And you don't strike me as the type of person that's going to be, you know, like doing lactic testing or, you know, getting in to the specific decimal point. But I think to have achieved the success that you have, you would need to have some sort of structure or planning or training program. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear a little bit about what's your methodology or your approach to your training. Yeah. So I usually plan out, um, a couple months in advance and kind of fine tune those week by week. And usually the way that I train is I'll have like an event. So I try to like maintain a pretty high level of fitness year long. And then as I hone in on an event, I'll like specify my training specifically for that event. So I'll research the event, learn as much as I can about it. Um, if I don't already know about it, you know, learn about the athletes that do well in it. And then I'll kind of tailor my training more specifically for that. And then so within the more fine-tuned training, I usually try to do about two or three sessions a week that are pretty specific and hard. And then the rest, the rest of my training is more just like building volume. And um, it's doing a lot of kind of listening to my body. So if I, you know, am really tired or something, or I'm just like uh, not feeling it, or maybe there's like some other stressor in my life, then I will, instead of doing a four hour session, maybe I'll do a two hour session or some days I start training and I just feel great. And I only have an hour plan, but I'll go out and end up doing five hours. Um, so things like that, where it's, it's a very kind of, there's like fixed elements within my training. And then there's like a fluid element where I'm kind of, um, yeah, just trying to listen to my body and, and react accordingly and that's i guess that's worked pretty well for me um yeah throughout the years and it's like i think good way to kind of stay motivated and avoid injury as well and so you said that you keep a general baseline um and i would say you know kicking off a year with a hundred kilometer race is like a pretty dang impressive baseline um i'd love to know how many <laughs> hours a week do you train uh usually about 20 to 25 hours a week um, and that kind of varies to pay, like depending on intensity. Like when I was training for Spartan Road Champs, I was doing a lot more uh, intensity and a lot more running. So that number probably dropped to like more like 15 or 16 hours a week um, and things like that. Yeah. So have you always handled your own training or do, have you ever worked with the coach or do you have any like advisors <laughs> that kind of help you along the way? Uh, yeah, I when I first started mountain biking, I had a coach for about a season and I, I learned a lot from them. I read a bunch of books and then I've just been self-coached since. So I, I love the process. And I also, I think there's some really amazing coaches out there, but I also think that nobody is going to care as much about your results or your performance as you will care about your own. And nobody is going to have the same degree of feedback as you would have with yourself if you're actually able to listen to yourself. So like, I think that's where a lot of coaching, um, I wouldn't say falls apart, but maybe there's kind of like a, a drawback there because like, yeah, I obviously care about how I do. And so I'm always thinking about it and then I'm adjusting and I'm planning and things like that. Whereas even if you have a coach that you talk to every day, they have other things going on in their lives. Um, and they kind of like, you know, when they check in, they care about you and they think about you but then the rest of the time they're not. And they're like, they don't know that you had that, uh, you know, that 
really hard time getting through the interval set. They just see the data. They're like, oh, he got through it. But they don't know that like it almost tore you apart <laughs> to do that last set or something like that. And then like, that's a sign that like, oh, maybe the fatigue is too high or something like that. And so like you go back to the drawing board or you, you adjust your training. Um, so yeah. Nice. And you've you've said you really definitely like to to learn and continue to grow. Are there some certain uh, resources you go back to often that help you learn a lot? Is there some certain podcasts or books that you've really enjoyed either recently or kind of in the past that kind of help continue to push you forward? Yeah, I really like the Trainer Road podcast. Um, I find that one's really good. It just touches on like a lot of different topics. I started listening a little bit to the human lab podcast uh, like that too. And then uh, um, is that some of the like those training training Bibles were, were like some of the first books that I read. And I think a lot of the um, a lot of the stuff there kind of still holds up pretty well. Um, and then just like learning from different athletes. I think it's like a it's just like a never ending experiment. It's like you see what this athlete does and you think that something makes sense that they do so you might try it in your training and if it helps you keep it and if it doesn't you get rid of it that's like um, what are some of the other habits that you have kind of outside of training that allow you to continue to uh, be strong and move forward maybe around like recovery or nutrition things like that that you really focus on yeah so uh my one of my friends was actually telling me this i was riding with mountain bike with him this spring and we were talking about stuff and he was like oh yeah Ryan the year so he raced in the Tour de France and he was like the season that I did the best was the year that I did all the little things and uh and I was like wow okay that's pretty powerful so like this year starting like this spring I basically every night would foam roll and just do like a little bit of uh mobility and activations and things like that and um and I've always kind of done those in my running and warm-ups cool downs things like that and so um I would say that that's become a habit just like all those uh yeah just like finding what works for you and what like fits into your schedule and like what you'll actually do and not like <laughs> overtax you um and then just like sticking with it I guess and as far as nutrition uh I kind of eat everything but i'd say we also eat like really healthy um every night is like big salad as well as like a bunch of food it could be like pasta it could be um a stir fry it could be some kind of bowl it could be whatever and um i find like the biggest thing is just not limiting your um not limiting your your food intake and like eating a lot of different things has worked for me Amazing. And then what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've made in your career, whether around training, nutrition, or uh, maybe not doing the little things? Yeah, I think the biggest mistakes I've made are just, um, well, a pretty easy like mistake to identify would be to just showing up to events like under rested mm -hmm. and things like that and trying to train too hard before an event. Whereas like, um, and I think that as I've gotten older I've like more realized that I can't get away with that as much anymore and that I need to like uh like I would always just be like oh train through this event train through that event train through this and then now it's like oh if I want to actually have that last couple percent I actually need to like come into it rested and so like really choosing your battles and choosing the events that are perfect that are more important to you um has been a good lesson and then also yeah just not I guess learning to like recognize the signs of like overtraining and overreaching um, really early and like not fall into those traps as when I first started uh, when I first started like racing bikes I would just constantly <laughs> be, be overreaching or overtraining and um, it was kind of like oh this person does you know, through our rides every day, plus longer, plus intensity, like I, that's what it takes to do to like succeed. And I would just like try to emulate those things and then um, just fall apart. So I guess another mistake would just be trying to do what other people do because it works for them and not doing the things that like 
you know in your heart of hearts like works for you or that um yeah so that's another good i guess mistake as far as like nutrition and things like that go i don't think i don't think i necessarily have an answer for that uh i've always tried to yeah i guess just yeah trying to limit limit calories too much or trying to um you know achieve certain body uh think you're like oh if I'm lighter I'll be faster so I should stop eating and that just like never works so um not that I've had like any really bad issues with that but I think that a lot of endurance athletes you know have that thought and have that um yeah like kind of flirt with that path at some point in time and it's just like it's never worth it (laughs) what are the signs of burnout for you uh signs of burnout for me are like I guess being irritable being uh unmotivated and like the best one is just like not getting out the door for training not being excited to train I think um to be like oh it took me like <laughs> or just like oh I'm, I'm gonna go training and then you're like you start doing chores around the house instead <laughs> like oh well I better wash the dishes before I go train and it's like oh well, I should probably vacuum too and then it's just like an hour goes by and you're like oh yeah, I'm probably overtrained. <laughs> and I would imagine that sticks out in a big way because you bring, it seems like you get so much joy and have so much fun in your training. So if you aren't enjoying it, that is like a huge sign, I would imagine. Oh, it's just a big red flag <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, how many hours a night do you sleep? Uh, oh, usually between eight and nine hours a night. Um, and I'm a pretty good sleeper, so that's like uh and that's like actual sleep so I'm just like lay down for like 10 and then like nice. the actual like my whoop says that I got you know nine and a half or nine hours or something of actual sleep so yeah which I'm like I'm like where did that hour go I'm always like where did that other hour go because I'm like I don't remember being awake for an hour it's just like I don't know maybe I move around a lot when I'm sleeping but like, yeah, a lot of nights, like you lay down at whatever time, 10 o'clock and you wake up at eight and you're like, okay, that should be 10 And It's Like you got nine hours of sleep. So, yeah. oh. <laughs> that was the most infuriating thing when I first started using my whoop was the fact that I didn't get the hours of sleep that I thought I was getting. It is so illuminating because you right. think you're getting eight hours and you are not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. I want to talk about relaxation because I have seen that you enjoy sewing. I read something about you, you know, have sewed your own sleeping bags. So I'd like yeah. to talk about that to start your, your sewing and then go into some okay. other things that you do to relax that are not sports. Yeah. Yeah. I really like sewing. I don't know what it was. I used to crochet a lot and I haven't done that now in a little while. I would like make hats and other things, but um, yeah, sewing is I like making my own gear and making bags and I just made a pack um, and frame bags, like packing gear. And it's just like, I guess it's like the engineering side of my brain. I just like, it's pretty fun, like creative little process. And I don't like follow any patterns or um, really like try to plan it out too much. I just like, I guess, see like what I want it to be like. And then I just, start cutting and uh usually works out pretty well um so yeah I really like I don't know I don't know how I like fell into sewing but it's uh it's good and my wife got like a (laughs) a new sewing machine a couple years ago for Christmas from her parents and like I use it like I probably you know spent 100 or 200 hours on it and she spent like two so it's pretty funny um I also enjoy woodworking um building stuff and yeah I just made a like big slab table not too long ago out of like a a bunch of maple that I like milled myself and dried for a few years and then finally turned into a table so um yeah stuff like that I don't have access to like a big shop so it's like maybe one day I'll have a big shop and I think I would do a lot more woodworking if I had access so it's like everything takes three times as long because you have to like set up a place and do all these things that um take forever but uh yeah that's another thing that I love doing to relax and unwind 
Yeah, your hobbies are as diverse as your sports. I love it. Um, and since you brought up Lindsay, and I'm sure yeah. she's right beside you and driving, but we're going to talk about oh, her yeah. anyway. Um, okay. I, wanna he- <laughs> I want to hear about how you met, um, because you both are this OCR, and I guess now ultra running power couple. Um, you both win everything. Um, how did you meet sort of what's your story and how does your training and sort of lifestyle integrate as both being elite, uh, professional athletes? Yeah, totally. So we actually met at a mountain bike race at Albion Hills, um, a Tuesday night race, uh, many years ago and a friend of hers that she had went to high school with, and I had just kind of become friends with him, um, introduced us and, um, yeah and then we started dating and then we all like moved in together at a, in a farmhouse and uh and things kind of just spiraled from there and it's pretty awesome having a partner that you can you know share this lifestyle with and share um just so many of the ups and downs of training and racing and um yeah, being an endurance athlete i think that it's uh it's pretty special because a lot of people I guess, aren't able to spend as much time with their partner as like we can. And I think it's like definitely a testament to our relationship. Um, Sometimes like, sometimes Lindsay complains because she's like, I spend, you know, 24 hours a day with Ryan because we, you know, we train together and then we sleep together and then we eat together. It's like, they don't have that, like that work escape or that um, things like that. But uh so I guess there's definitely an element of spending a lot of time together, but it's, um, yeah, it's been great. And I think that we are our own, our two own, our biggest fans, I guess. And uh, it's just great having someone there who who knows kind of like what you're going through or what you've been through and can give you meaningful um, advice and tips and feedback in the moment instead of just, I feel like if I had a partner who wasn't an athlete, there might be more resentment or just less understanding uh, around that. Because, yeah, a lot of the training and stuff we do is pretty selfish uh, or it can be. And so, like, knowing that it's like, oh, well, you know, you have to do this today because I'm going to go for a three-hour run and then, or whatever. It's just like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's great. That's amazing. And we always get in trouble if we do not mention an athlete's dogs. So I need to hear <laughs> everything about your dogs. I know you recently yeah. got, I think Noodle is the new one. Yes, um, Noodle is the new one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we have Sunto and uh, we just got Noodle. So Sunto is, uh, he'll be 10 um, in like a week or two. He'll be turning 10 and he's a Malamute. He's about 100 pounds, black and white, big fluffy guy. And he's uh, he's great. He's been like on so many adventures with me and he's starting to slow down a little bit, but he still gets out for like, you know, hour to bus runs um, with us. And he loves going in the mountains, loves winter. And then we just got Noodle who... Uh, we didn't think would be such a spitting image of Sunto, but um, as her mom was, uh, she's a Malamute as well. And she's about four and a half months old, um, almost 50 pounds already. So she's going to be a big girl and, uh, and she's great. She's has just such a great personality. She loves people uh, um, really switched on. And uh, yeah, she looks <laughs> a lot like Sunto, same eyebrows very similar markings so it's it's kind of pretty funny that we have <laughs> these two these two guys people are like well is that his is, you know are they brothers or it's like no no they just happen to look the same no so, yeah they're great awesome well thank you for indulging us we we if <laughs> you know we need to talk about the dogs um we want to focus a little bit now on looking forward and what's next but um so switching gears back to your sports i just want to talk a little bit about like why what is your why what makes you get up every single day to do these sports what is my why um it's funny because my sports psychologist asks me that all the time but it's usually <laughs> like it's usually more with respect to like an event it's like what is your why for this mm. race but it's like the the big why I guess is one that I don't think about too often um I think like 
I just, I love movement and I love like seeing, I love that like answering those questions. Like, can I do this or can I, you know, perform or can I do this training or, um, you know, if I do this many hours, what's going to be the results, things like that. I, lo- I just love all those. I love the journey and I love the minutia of, of like what I do. And I think it's just so, it's so cool and challenging and engaging um, all at the same time. And I think that like, hopefully some people like get inspired by what I do and, you know, maybe find sports that they might not have and you know those turn into lifelong passions of of health and fitness and things like that and so I think that that is like another pretty powerful why of like um hopefully yeah getting people to get off the couch and do cool stuff yeah I think your why is going to resonate with a lot of people um and you talked (laughs) about pushing your limits um what helps you what sort of inspires you to sort of dig in and push forward and like overcome these obstacles like do you have music do you have mantras like what what do you sort of um look to to to, uh push your limits I think that's something that has evolved throughout my athletic career I think that like when I first started it was more about proving myself and proving myself to others and then it was about um like proving myself to myself I guess and then it was about um just like finding myself within these like emotions or these challenges and like seeing how they sat sat with me, I guess, Mm -hmm. like on an emotional level and like seeing, oh, if I push myself harder, how does that make me feel or things like that? Um, So yeah, I think that that has like evolved throughout the years for sure. I love it. Yeah, that's I feel like your story is going to resonate with a lot of people. It's like so cool to see somebody doing such a wide variety of things, but still being able to perform at a top level in so many things. I think a lot of people will be inspired by this. That's why we had you on and why you were such a requested (laughs) guest. Um, I wanted to jump over. uh, I've seen on your Instagram that you you work with some really awesome like companies and brands um, that are really helping you like recover and push your performance forward. Maybe talk to us about some of those, uh, some of those companies like athletic brewing and whoop and, uh, companies like that and kind of what they're doing to, to help you perform at your best. Yeah. I mean, we've been working with athletic brewing for a couple of years now and, uh, I just, I love their, (laughs) I like beer. beer. It's so good. It's so good. (laughs) We love it. Yeah. I like beer and I also know that it's not always great for you to have drink all the time. And so having this alternative um, that is non-alcoholic that I can enjoy and even just like use it as a recovery tool or after a run or things like that, or um, yeah, it's been amazing. Um, and they, they partnered with Whoop uh, this year. So we've gotten kind of on board there. Um, yeah. And the Whoop's really cool. It's like allowed me to, like you said, track some of my sleep metrics and, um, I'm pretty good at listening to it, but it's also like, it's hard because sometimes you're like, oh, I'm meeting a friend and we're doing this adventure, but it's saying I'm not recovered, but like I'm going anyways. So, um, I guess that's like, it's more, you can get away with that more in the off season when you're not like focusing on a big goal or event. Uh, and it's just like, now it's like collecting data and like seeing how those, recovery scores I actually feel when you're out training and like how does it feel on the third interval if if my recovery score is low and things like that um another company we work with is called uh human and they're um based out of Austin Texas and they make um a lot of nutritional supplements but more in the health and wellness field so they do a lot of like they make uh a lot of chews and like vitamin D and immunity things, um, support, but it's also, they're mostly known for their, uh, their beet, uh, the beetroot powder and stuff like that. So they actually have, um, on their science team, um, Nobel, uh, prize winner who discovered like beet, uh, nitric oxide effects. And so they, um, yeah, they make like some of the best, um, beet 
group powder products out there. And those are things that I've been taking for basically my entire career. And they just released a pretty cool. Now they have these pills, these like B-root pills. So now you don't even need the powder, um, which is super awesome. So that's like uh, a great like nitric oxide booster that I use before and even after a lot of my uh, a lot of my workouts. So I've been like, uh, Lindsay and I have both been like fortunate enough to be partnered with them for um, for many years now. It's been great. That's awesome. Yeah, some awesome companies that you're working with. Um, so I wanted to jump forward to see uh, kind of what you have planned. So first off, maybe uh, you could start with what you have kind of in the cards for 2023 coming up in terms of races and events that you're targeting. <laughs> Yeah, so 2023 is kind of a very exciting year. Um, I want to do more ultra running. So I'm going to try to get into uh, hopefully UTMB or um, another like big event like that. Uh, It's just a matter of like finding the qualifiers or finding like an avenue to actually get in because there's really hard events to actually get into. Um, And I'll be doing, so I'll be doing hopefully some ultras uh end of april kind of like uh i've got a few weeks there to hopefully squeeze one in and then i'm actually um mid-may i'm going to alaska to climb denali uh which will be really awesome so mid-may to mid-june i'll be there for a month um climbing and running and skiing uh so yeah that's gonna be incredible so like we have lots of alpinism um i might go there might be like some going for records it might be just skiing um different couloirs it might be just climbing it's going to really depend on conditions and um what's going on so that's kind of like a really big exciting thing that i'm doing this year and then when i get back from denali it's kind of like a mishmash of ultra running and a little bit of cycling and ocr so that'll be kind of um looking forward to the end of the season and a few sky races thrown in there as well yeah pretty awesome i'm pretty excited to just keep mixing it up that's awesome um and when we talk a little further down the line is there some like really big things that you have in mind that you want to knock off uh in the next couple years some epic events or anything like that that are are really on your bucket list oh man um well I guess like back to this year, if timing works out, try for the FKT on Nolan's 14, maybe on the Colorado Trail, mountain biking. And those are kind of like big bucket list items. So if that doesn't happen this year, that'll, you know, be down the road kind of thing. And then yeah, more climbing big mountains, um, potentially speed records on in the mountains. I think that's like what's really inspiring to me right now. It's like taking that athleticism and that endurance and moving it into an arena that is like, I guess, just so beautiful and not 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 like contrived by humanity, I guess. It's like a lot of the events we do are just like made up. It's like, oh, look, here's this trail that a human built that we have to run from this like building that a human built to this other building that a human also built and everything's just like, yeah and and like with mountaineering and alpinism it's like here's this mountain it's basically the same that it's been for ever and now we go up it so it's like to me there's like an element of purity there Hmm. and because (laughs) when you're thinking about all of these things like you probably more than most professional athletes who do not work with a sports psychologist you spend a lot of time thinking through, you were saying like the why of each event. I'd love to know what your actual, what the legacy that you want to leave on the sport is. I think <laughs> I kind of want to leave the legacy of just like, of nothing. It's just like, I don't know, <laughs> just <laughs> if that's even an answer, but it's like, I think that like a lot of the stuff we do is so transient and almost meaningless that it's just like I just want to do the things and if they inspire people or they leave a mark then cool and if they don't then they were just done and then that's the end it's almost like trying to leave an indelible mark on on anything is speaking to the uh like the need of 
humans to like conquer things and like be immortal when we're all just like you know yeah not so yeah I love that. You're like an endurance, like Sand Mandela. Have you heard of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Um, we always ask this question in closing. So we've invited you on the show because you're our endurance icon. Um, who's who's yours? Oh, my endurance icon. Uh, I'd say my endurance icon right now would be my friend Jack Gunzel. He's uh he just like lives in his van and he just smashes. Um, he's like in the mountains somewhere in the U.S. just skiing every day. And he like took one of Killian Jornet's like big FKTs this summer on the Bog Graham round. And he doesn't do any racing. He just like gets after it. Uh, but he probably trains more and harder than like anyone I know. And uh, and he's just like psyched about it. Um, so yeah, I, I respect that, I guess. I love that. And you have so many exciting things. Ahead. <laughs> How can people follow your journey? Where's the best place for them to find you? Yeah, probably just on Instagram. I'm Ryan I can say it there and just like, yeah, I'm fairly active there. It's probably the best place. And yeah, feel free to reach out if you ever have any questions or anything like that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. I, we hope you travel safe and that you have an amazing winter in the mountains. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope the uh, the audio was okay. And this definitely helped pass one of the 38 hours uh, required in this trip. <laughs> wow. How great was that? I always learned so much from these endurance icons. If you enjoyed the podcast as well, please consider liking us across social media, subscribing to us on YouTube, or giving us a five-star rating on wherever you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate you and your support so much. We wish you happy training and we'll see you back next week.